Welcome to the Be Ruthless Show, where we have the conversations that other people don't, the conversations that other people won't. I'm your host, Sam Ruth, and I'm ready to make a lot of noise and disrupt things ruthlessly. Thanks for being here today. Now let's get to it. Welcome back to the Be Ruthless Show. I'm your host, Sam Ruth, and joining me today is Dr. Marianne Miller, who has been in the mental health field for 25 years and has specialized in eating disorders for the last 10. She was a full-time academic for 12 years and had a part-time eating disorder practice for much of that time, until she left the university and went into private practice full-time in 2018. Dr. Miller loves working with eating disorders as a therapist and a coach. She takes a non-diet feminist approach that helps people of all genders live empowered, authentic lives. She embraces the health at every size model and is LGBTQIAA plus affirming in, affirming. in November, she launched the Elite Binge Eating Recovery Method. It's a virtual coaching system that helps high performers regain their mental and emotional energy by shifting their relationship with food to be fully present in their life. We all need you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, oh, I'm so grateful to be here. And it's, it's so good, so good to get to know you too, Sam. We both put it out there in the world. And so we connected because I commented on one of your posts and I just appreciate anyone who's willing to be open and honest about topics that are under discussed. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, Grief is definitely um, under disc- uh, under discuss, and when it comes to recovery uh, from binge eating, there is, there are um, like loss elements and grieving elements to it. It's not like grieving a spouse; so it's not like that kind of grief, but there is a sense of loss that people go through as they recover, which I'd love to dive into. I would. No one has ever brought up that point. Oh. Um, really in that type of a way, I would love to discuss that. I've dealt with so many clients, who, um, but n- only one at a, a really, really dangerously physical, unsafe level. Um, so how did you get so passionate about this and devote your time to such a difficult area? Well, it really is my calling. Um, I I really do feel like this is what I'm meant to be doing. Um, and there were, there were two like factors that contributed to me getting here. Um, the first is that I had an eating disorder myself, um, which started when I was in elementary school and, uh, kind of changed forms, um, from kind of an anorexic, uh, part uh, or form uh, when I was in uh, when I was in middle school to when I got my driver's license. That's when I started binging uh, because I had ac- more access to foods that my family didn't allow in the home. And then it really changed throughout the years um, until we moved out here from Texas where I went to graduate school to San Diego, California, where um, I was finally able to find a therapist who truly specialized in eating disorders. I had seen therapists in the past who said they tr- worked with them, but they didn't really get it. And when, after I found that person here um, and then got some group support as well, we were able to get me to the place at which I recovered fully. And during that time, I actually really hesitated um, in uh, to treat eating disorders. I was actually working with people who had chronic pain. So when I was um, both prior to um, working for a university out here um, and while the first few years of working at the university, I had a part-time private practice and I I treated people who had chronic pain and I found that a lot of them had disordered eating. And so I was like, oh, okay, I need to get more training on this. And so the university actually uh, offered a class on eating disorders for therapists. And I sat in on the class and I read all the textbooks and I just fell in love with it. 
And at that point, I was recovered enough to get more training on how to treat people. And I was thankfully uh, live in San Diego and we have the University of San Diego Eating Disorder Center, which is one of the top treatment and uh, research facilities for eating disorders in the nation. And they offer weekly trainings for providers and, and, and plus conferences and additional trainings. And I just I just dove straight into the deep end and soaked everything up until I got to the point at which I was ready to start uh, to transition my practice from chronic pain to uh, eating disorders. And I actually have several clients who have both chronic pain and eating disorders. So uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was me resisting doing eating disorders until really the universe was like, yeah, no, you're going to do this. <laughs> and then when I did, I just, I fell in love with it. It just filled me with so much energy. And, you know, I know everyone's journey is not my journey. Everyone has a different path, but I think I'm able to offer a level of empathy and depth um, and then also kind of research academic knowledge that was really helpful for my clients. So I love it so much. You mentioned that you started therapy and group therapy. Yeah. Talk about that group piece is really important. And a lot yeah. of majority of my clients with eating disorder struggled. We had to work to that. You know, it was yes. just, it was not a simple decision that it took a no. lot. No, the first time I went to the group, uh, it was a pretty large group. Um, I just kind of sat in the back and I cried the whole time. <laughs> I felt so vulnerable and I'd already been seeing my therapist for about a year and um, it, it was so hard for me to just be in this public place admitting something that I felt so shameful about. And um, it became a, a very important part of me recovering because those people became my people. Like they thought the way that I thought they acted around food, the way that I acted in many cases. And, um, you know, some of the people in that group are now lifelong friends and, you know, they really get me. And that's that was so awesome because eating disorders are so isolating. And the more you are in the eating disorder, you're the more isolated you uh, can be. And so doing the opposite of that, asking out for help and reaching out for support is really key to help you recover and move away from the shame as well. To anyone listening, please share this. That is so important and it is scary but you found your people, right? We oh, need, yeah. no matter, you could have the most amazing people in your life. We still need the people who get it without words and are there when other people think things are fine because this is an invisible thing. Yeah. Do you think it makes a difference in this day and age, whether someone starts with an online group versus an in-person group? I think now, no, uh, because with the pandemic, everyone's so uh, comfortable. Uh, I mean, they may not like them, <laughs> but everyone's so comfortable with online. And in many ways, people feel more comfortable in their own homes, like their pets can be next to them. I mean, I see most of my clients virtually, and a lot of times they have their cats sitting on their laps or their dogs, you know, next to them. And that is just really comforting. Um, and they can wrap themselves up in a blanket, get like a hot mug of tea. And um, I think, you know, being able to do that in a group is really helpful as well. It's like kind of like they can access a group while in their safe cocoon. Uh, and and so that that can be helpful. Um, I do think it is uh, having an in-person group, if you can swing it, is uh, especially helpful because a lot of people are afraid to go into public scenarios and expose their bodies because they have such negative feelings about their bodies. 
And so it just attending an in-person group in itself um, becomes an intervention mm -hmm. and uh, helps them, uh, helps counteract the, the social anxiety that comes with that. Absolutely. To anyone who feels like you could go in the room, sit in the back, observe and cry, mm -hmm. do so. Um, yeah. If you feel like an online group would be a step there. Oh, I absolutely. Think it would be in addition, not instead of. Uh, I think there are people, I don't want anyone to wait when we have so many resources. Absolutely. And there's so many more online groups and a lot of people listening may not have access you know, to groups when, I mean, when I started college, I was in, uh, I went to a small school in the middle of nowhere um, for the first two years. Then I transferred to the University of Colorado um, and uh, there was nothing. That was when I first realized I had an eating disorder was an undergrad and, in my sophomore year. And there was nothing available, even at the college. I mean, this was in the early nineties. And so people just weren't talking about it that much. They had a guest speaker come and talk about it. Thank goodness. And I was like, oh, wow, this sounds like me. <laughs> and, and then, and so we had to drive to the bigger city close by because I didn't have a car. I had friends drive me, um, which was like an hour away um, for me to go to a support group. So it's, um, I'm, I mean, I think back then if I would have had the online support, uh, it, it would have had a, a much different outcome. I probably would have gotten recovery a lot sooner. Yeah. And we don't all have access to University of San Diego and those amazing resources. No. <laughs> but hopefully there's something nearby. Again, always I, I would say 988 is a great resource. If finding something near you is too overwhelming because I get that just even Googling and doing the research yourself can be a lot, then mm -hmm. reach out to someone and we can do that for you. 988 any professional uh, should be able to take that research time off of your hands and give you a few to choose from. Oh, sure, sure. And there's actually on my website, I, I do an eating disorder blog. So, um, and I've been doing it for years and I outline a lot of resources and online resources, resources in different states and cities. So they can just go to my website. Um, uh, drmariannemiller.com and search that information. The, pro the problem awesome. with, um, you know, social media and the internet is there's a lot of not great information about eating disorder recovery out there. And uh, that's, and also information that's not based on research. Um, and so it's really important to find reputable sources um, the uh, NIDA, the National Eating Disorders Association, uh, has a great website. I think it's nationaleatingdisorders.org. Um, and then there's another good website called uh, Feast. Um, it's for family members of people with eating disorders. So the website is feast-ed.org. Um, and those are very reputable. Uh, so but I, again, I have like a blog post on other great online sources. So, uh, and, you know, people can always message me <laughs> on uh, Instagram and ask me for sources because I'm happy to, happy to give them. It's really, I just want people to recover because I know how amazing life can be. And honestly, that first interaction, sending that first email or message or however you can, that's the hardest and mm -hmm. know that if you're reaching out to Dr. Miller or me or some, we we don't just give our numbers out and put that stuff out there for people to look at. We truly mean it. We yeah. don't want you to suffer in silence and suffer alone when we know you don't believe it yet, but we can help you see that you are not alone. Yeah. Um, I want to shift to, um, I can't remember if it's the anti-diet or the non-diet approach. Oh, use. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Non-diet weight inclusive approach. Right. So, um, so non-diet is a, a term, uh, I think it, it, it was bandied about on social media a lot. And the, the focus is that 
uh, on on science <laughs> is that you know 98 plus percent of the time diets don't work you know and they might work initially but uh, it, they're not sustainable and researchers have found this to be the case over and over and over again and so like me, when I was in elementary school, that's how I started, is I started going on diets, on the fad diets of the 80s um, at that time. And that got me into a restrictive pattern that went into anorexia in my middle school years where I lost my period, you know, but nobody called it really or saw it at the time um, because I didn't look like the stereotypical anorexic as people thought back in the eighties. Um, but I, uh, so I have developed, um, a very strong stance against dieting. And the reason is, is because the researchers have found that for young girls, the more they have dieted, the more chances they are to develop that, they, that they will develop an eating disorder. Um, so dieting is defined as restricting your food in some way, shape, or form, whether it's restricting the calories, the amount, uh, restricting certain food groups like carbs or sugar, or, you know, in the, in the nineties, it was restricting fat and now it's restricting carbs and sugar. It's just like every generation has their own thing. <laughs> and, um, and it's very, very difficult to sustain. And it also like causes or increases people um, mentally obsessing about food. Um, because like if you, it's just kind of human nature. If you tell people not to do something and not to think about something, they're going to want to do it, even if they didn't do it before. So like Sam, for you, if I tell you, um, don't think about a pink elephant, like, I'm sure you weren't thinking about a pink elephant before I asked that question, but now like there's probably pink elephants floating around in the air, <laughs> right? And so, so that's just the nature is you tell people don't eat food groups X and Y, or don't eat this type of foods, um, then people are going to start obsessing about it. And so uh, any sort of diet, honestly, is what launches many of people to come get help from me is because they've done a certain very restrictive diet for a certain amount of time and they're undernourished and uh, their brains aren't working and regardless of the body size uh, they they have been deprived of major nutrients and enough calories for them to function and they're having they're suffering from the effects of it, including, um, you know, heightened anxiety, depression, fatigue, um, you know, mental fogginess, you know, cognitive functioning impaired, their ability to think. Uh, and they're just absolutely miserable, but they want to keep dieting. And so that's what I have to do is kind of slowly kind of separate them from this diet mindset. Um, or diet culture, as a lot of eating disorder professionals call it, into an all food fits model, which is a, a very food neutral way of looking at things. So all, uh, so you know, there's no good or bad foods or unhealthy or healthy foods. It's where you know all foods fit, and you're. Um, you know, yes, there, you want to kind of cover all your bases in terms of food groups, just for nutrition purposes. But um, it doesn't mean that one food group is superior to another, because what that sets up is the sense of morality around eating food, like I ate food X. Um, and like I ate pizza last night. And before when I was really in my eating disorder, I would have thought, oh my gosh, I, that was, that was bad. I, I ate bad food. And now I'm like, wow, pizza, you have lycopene and the tomato sauce. I had some green peppers and mushrooms on it. I had protein with the, the cheese. I had some fats. I had some carbs. Like I had all this wonderful food 
that was very satisfying for me. And so like, um, so instead of looking at any food as bad, seeing that all food has value, I mean, it really boils down to glucose, you know, and so it, it helps nourish us. So that's, that's the anti-diet or uh, approach. And then weight inclusivity means that people of all, of all sizes and shapes can achieve health, that weight uh, doesn't necessarily equate health. And that's a huge a myth that is, ex exists in our society and very deeply in our medical systems and oftentimes in our mental health systems too, is that if you are in a larger body or in a fat body, you can't be healthy. You can't um, you know, eat healthy, um, or you can't, um, do things that are healthy for you. Like, like for me, because I'm in a fat body, um, people, <laughs> I've had so many physicians assume that I have blood sugar problems, even though I tell them I like diabetes does not run in my family. I've never had blood sugar issues. Like that's not been a problem. Everyone, I just, I can't, it's like, I'm a broken record telling people that. And every single time it's like, Oh, your blood sugar is fine. Yes, <laughs> it is fine. There are people in thin bodies with type two diabetes. <laughs> like it really isn't, but it's a huge assumption and stereotype. So it's, it's, that's where I go. And sometimes I have clients who come and say, um, yes, you know, I want to stop binging and I really want to lose weight. And I tell them, well, but weight loss is really outside of my scope as a therapist and it's really outside of my focus as a coach is that I really want to help you um, reduce the amount of binging or eating disorder behaviors you're engaging in and eventually eliminate those behaviors. Like that's my focus. And I want you to feel better and feel more energized and be able to show up and be more present in your relationships and, you know, be able to be more effective in your career and have all those wonderful benefits. I want you to get your brain back, you know, because the eating disorder really hijacks your brain. I love this conversation and I want anyone listening to rewind and listen <laughs> um, <laughs> again, because I think a lot of people assume that getting help for an eating disorder means I have to eat a certain way. I have to eat certain things and nope. they were this treatment because of that. So I, I want people to know that you can find people who have your viewpoint, who share your perspectives and what your beliefs, because they're, they're out there. They might be fewer and further between. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I have, that's, that's a really great point that I, I mean, I've been on a lot of podcasts and, and nobody has really brought that up, that fear that people have of that you know, that if you're going to get help, that um, the the providers are going to tell you to eat a certain way. That's a really, really good point because that I've seen come up um, in a, a couple of areas. Um, the first is this belief that if I get recovered from an eating disorder, I can't eat my family's cultural and ethnic heritage, you know, foods, like those are off the table because those are often the foods that are targeted that people say, well, if you have diabetes, you know, you can't have tortillas anymore, or you can't have latkes, you know, if you're Jewish or whatever, it's like, no, that's not, it's not what we're talking about. And, um, and uh, so, so that, I think that is really important. And then also like, if you're a vegan, uh, I mean, I think that has been something that uh, a lot of my clients, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, a, a percentage of my clients have come in and say, you know, being vegan is really important to me. Can I recover while still being vegan? I say, absolutely. You know, that is, I've done it many, many times and worked with people with that and then worked with people who have other 
you know, restrictions because of health problems, you know, it just, we just want to make sure that's not part of the eating disorder mindset, but um, typically it's not, it's like a separate thing. So um, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure we are not going to put you on a diet. So it's going to be the actual opposite. We're like you can have the cookie. <laughs> Sometimes can even have it with breakfast. Woo. <laughs> But that's scary for certain people. Oh, yeah. but if I don't that's want it, terrifying. Oh, yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying. Well, if people don't want to have a cookie, like if they're on the more restrictive end of the eating disorder spectrum, um, then we, you know, typically I work with eating disorder dietitians who I trust, um, and we help my clients. Uh, look at fear foods, things that they are afraid of. And we do what what's called food exposures. And, you know, if you're in the therapy world, you may be familiar with exposure, exposure therapy, um, or exposure interventions. Um, and so like, for example, if you're afraid of flying on an airplane, so you do like a gradual exposure to flying. So you first may drive by the airport and then the second step is to get you to the point where you can like go and park in the airport parking lot for 20 minutes. And then you eventually get to the point where you actually go into the terminal and sit. And then you just keep going on and on until you can absolutely uh, eventually do ride on a plane. And like, it may not be the most like fabulous experience, um, but you are eventually able to do that because you've built up the coping skills and the distress tolerance. And that's the same with fear foods. Although I think for a lot of my clients, their fear foods, um, a lot of them end up liking them, not all, but a lot of them get to the point where they're like, yeah, like I could, I know that I could have a cookie for breakfast if I want to, I may not want to, but like I can and I do. And yeah, we, we kind of mix it up sometimes. Like sometimes we have breakfast for lunch, you know, <laughs> lunch for breakfast <laughs> and, and it gets people out of the rigid thinking that's so common with people with it, eating disorders. What is your program? Like, I'd love to share it. Sure. And Yes, yes. So uh, it's called the Elite Binge Eating Recovery Method, and it's a virtual coaching system that involves three months of uh, top of the line and virtual coaching by me, and um, and then access to an integrated online course uh, that I designed, and it really takes people from. Um, from being obsessed about food, eating, and body image 90% of the time to where they're thinking about it 10% or less of the time. Uh, it, it gets people to reduce and eliminate binge eating behaviors and gives them, you know, the, the mental clarity and the energy to be able to show up in their lives, to have like a peace of mind and, uh, to be able to improve their relationships with food and then enhance their relationship with others. I remember, uh, you know, when I was in grad school and, um, and I was dating my husband and we, after we were engaged and first were married, I, uh, I would go to my favorite restaurant with him and be on this amazing date. And I couldn't focus on the date because I was calculating everything I was eating, the calories in my head. And that, that's just so heartbreaking to me because I wasn't able to be fully present with him. And now, and for years now, since I've been recovered, I can totally show up. I, I couldn't tell you what calories are in things that, that is completely gone. Like I have, I'm thinking about way more cooler stuff, you know, <laughs> than that. And so being able to regain, regain that freedom and the men and mental energy and the clarity, really being able to show up for your kids, for your spouses, for your loved ones, for your pet, you know, um, it's, it's a very powerful thing. And I think it's the best thing, gifts you can give yourself. What if there's someone who isn't binging, but is restricting? Um, so that my coaching program would not be for those people. Um, so mine is for people who are binging, binging, purging, and emotionally eating. 
Um, so people who are on the more restrictive end, um, I highly recommend that you seek out a qualified eating disorder therapist. So um, right now my uh, private practice is completely full and probably will be for at least the next few months. Um, and I'm in the state of California. And, and so you'd have to be in California anyway. But um, I'd be happy if people wanted to reach out and we're looking for providers. I'm tapped into a nationwide network of really good quality eating disorder therapists that I could give you some referrals. Um, and uh, you want specialists that people who like 70% or more of their practice is eating disorders. Like you want people, because it's such a complex issue, especially with the more restrictive eating disorders um, and the mortality rate is so high for mental disorders. Um, you just want to make sure you you have someone who has a lot of training and experience in it. And so this will all be in the show notes, but drmarianmiller.com. Correct. And Marian is spelled M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E. Yes. That's amazing, yes. but scary. Like yeah. think about how your practice is full and people are not talking about this. And I have this stereotype in my mind. I could be completely wrong, but I feel like the pressure in California is up there I, with beach life and image. Uh, so I, I don't see you ever having a shortage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's job, it's job security for sure. Yeah, so Southern California, there is um, a lot more. It's very image focused. Um, and I noticed that uh, when we moved out here. But it really, I think, especially since the pandemic, the prevalence of eating disorder disorders uh, has increased exponentially. And then also, I think it's less taboo to seek mental help mental health help for people. And so people are, are getting help, which is great, but like, it's, you know, it's hard to find good. It's, I know it's, it's a cliche, but it's hard to find good help and it's hard to find good eating disorder therapists. So, you know, feel free, you know, if people want to reach out to me and I can, um, you know, send you in some directions. So if someone is listening and thinking about your group, but they're not sure what is virtual. What does it mean? Am I working with you one-on-one? -on -one? Is it a group of people? That's a good question. So uh, it's a weekly consultation group with a smaller group of people. And then they have um, access uh, to message me over WhatsApp or leave me voice memos um, during the work week. And I will get back to them. And then we have a pri small private Facebook group where they have access to as well, where, you know, they can ask questions and have that kind of group support. So, and the thing is, is that, yes, I'm a coach and I'm an eating disorder therapist. So like, I'm going to make sure that this group is really, really safe for everyone. And there's not going to be anything triggering in terms of what we discuss. Like I'm I, I will not allow that to happen. So, and having this program and making sure it's really safe, uh, where people feel very safe, that's really, really important. So. In my experience with groups, people have been more comfortable if they knew me first. Yeah. Or if there was an introduction, they didn't, weren't just yeah. walking into a room, not only with the group, but not knowing who was running it. So if it sounds good, is there a way to email or contact you through your website so that? You yes. Can yeah, them? absolutely. Yeah. They can email me and um, we could, you know, have like a little consultation. I do have an onboarding, um, a 30 minute onboarding call prior to them starting the group, just for me get, to get to know their background so I can better tailor the uh, program to them. Uh, and so, uh, but yes, absolutely. They can do that. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty transparent about my own journey, about how I treat and see eating disorders um, on my Instagram at Dr. Marianne Miller. Um, and then on Facebook um, at Dr. Marianne Miller and um, on my website in my blog. So if you want to get to know more about me, 
I do a lot of Instagram lives. Um, you can watch some of my videos uh, just so you can feel more comfortable. I totally get it. You know, this is this is really vulnerable. So you want to make sure that you you know, like, and trust the person. So yeah, take your time. What else do you want people to know? Final thoughts for everyone listening. My final thought is that um, eating disorders are um, something that you can recover from completely. I think there is a myth that it's a lifelong condition and that is not true with the right help with a good, you know, provider or team of providers, if you're working with a dietitian as well. And I do have a dietitian who comes and leads the group once a month in my program um, with the right help that you will be able to recover. And I know it, I've seen it, I've, I've lived it. And recovery is the best gift that you can give yourself because it is truly how you can live an amazing life. I'm so glad you said that because that myth is widespread and widespread. people do think this is lifelong and I will mm-hmm. never. And so you're not mm-hmm. alone. Connect with Dr. Marianne Miller at drmariannemiller.com. Reach out to me if you would like an introduction. Yes. Just don't struggle alone or in silence. And yeah. until next time, everyone, until next year, always be this. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Your support means everything to me, truly. If this podcast resonates with you, please do me a favor and join in the Ruthless Movement by making some noise and doing one of these four things. Subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Tell a friend so we can break stigmas even faster. Leave a review so people can see what you think of the show. And last, if you want to learn more about me and be a part of the Grief Hub community, please head on over to the Facebook group. We'd love to have you. Thanks again for spending your time with us and see you next week.